Okay, well, uh, first I want to say thank you to, to Baumidian for organizing this meeting and inviting me. It, it looks like it's going to be a really great event. So uh, I'm going to be talking about using machine learning for prediction of uh, climate and weather. And my outline is that, well, first there's an introduction, and, and, and then I'm going to give some uh, continue the introduction with, with some uh, a little bit of review, uh, prediction of a stationary spatio-temporally chaotic system. And uh, th that, that's being, uh, I'll be talking about that because that's, that's the character uh, of, of weather and climate, spatio-temporal chaos. And then uh, I'll talk about a, a hybrid knowledge-based machine learning approach that uh, uh, Baumedian uh, alluded to as being one of the main uh, things that, that, that we do in this general field. And then I'm going to combine that with a, a so-called parallel approach uh, for the application of, of climate and weather. And the, the motivation for that is that the parallel approach allows looking at, at, at systems that are really enormous and huge and have uh, tremendous dimensionality. Uh, so <clears throat> whether, as we know, uh, the, the, the task is to produce short-term uh, predictions of, of, uh, uh, of atmospheric state variables on the order of, of, of days. And here we're interested in the, you know, the, the, the specific values of these uh, uh, variables like temperature and rainfall, et cetera. In climate prediction, we want to do the prediction over uh, many years, possibly decades, possibly 100 years or more. And uh, in, in this case, we're, we're interested in the statistics of atmospheric and, and say oceanic dynamical patterns, for example. Chaos limits weather prediction, but it does not limit climate prediction. And another very important distinction is that long time scale interactions of the atmosphere with slowly evolving components like, like the oceans, ice covered regions, plant ecology, and so forth are, are important for climate prediction and crucial uh, for that, but not for weather prediction because they're so slow that over the time scale of a typical uh, weather forecast of the order of 10 days, they're just constant. So you could just use whatever their initial value was and just say that that's, that's what it is in the future at least for that future, that, that short future. So uh, to begin, I, I want to talk about this situation shown on this slide, namely given a past state measurement time series from an unknown dynamical system, predict the future evolution of those measurements. And we're first going to consider the situation in which the system whose state variables are being measured and who we want to, and, and whose variables we want to predict is a stationary system in, in time. So the stationary system is producing this vector U of T that you see on, on the bottom left and the, the elements of uh, the vector U are, are the different measurements. And we have a, a long time series of past, past evolution. And, and so we can train the machine learning device so that when you put in U of T, we hope to get out an approximation of the uh, training data at the time U of T plus delta T. And uh, let, let's say we, we've done that and we come to the end of our training data, then we put in U of T at that time at the end of the training data. It gives us a, an actual prediction now into the future by delta T, and we feed that back into the input 
and we get out uh, an estimate of, of, of the prediction at time t plus two delta t, which we then feed back in and get out an estimate at time uh, t plus three delta t. And I'm gonna think of delta t as being rather small so that, uh, so that what I'm getting out at these discrete times pretty much tells me what, what the continuous time function U of t, t is in the future, at least it, it estimates that. Now this, this prediction system that you see on, on the left it, it, with a closed loop is itself a dynamical system and we can apply dynamical systems theory to it. So maybe there's some hope of doing what Baumedian was uh, talking about in his introduction that is using uh, dynamical systems theory to understand machine learning. <clears throat> but I, I'm going to be interested in the case where the uh, uh, unknown dynamical system here is chaotic. And by the training, what we've done is we've made the uh, dynamical system on, on the right in the prediction phase uh, an approximate, in some sense, copy of that unknown, unknown system, which was chaotic. So uh, the, the uh, prediction system, we hope, is, is going to be uh, chaotic as well in the same way uh, as the unknown system. And therefore, whatever predictions we get are not going to be good for an arbitrarily long time because in, in chaos, small errors or perturbations grow exponentially in time. And uh, I'll, I'll call the uh, time over which uh, a perturbation, a small perturbation grows by a factor of, of E, I'll call that the, the Lyapunov time. And so what our ambition is, is that this uh, prediction system will predict for several Lyapunov times. Okay, but then comes the question of, of what exactly you put in this uh, gray box, uh, that is, what is the machine learning device? And there are a number of choices for that. And in my talk, I'm going to, to use the type of machine learning called reservoir computing. And one reason for doing this is that the training time for reservoir computing systems is, is relatively fast, particularly if the, the size of the, the required reservoir computer is not too large. But uh, I, I also want to note that most of what I'm talking about uh, can also be, be done using other machine learning types, such as deep learning types based on uh, on backpropagation. So now I come to the, the, the first uh, item in the outline, prediction of a stationary spatiotemporally chaotic system. And uh, here I'm going to use the uh, example uh, of the kuramoto shevashinsky equation. Uh, it's a simple uh, nonlinear partial differential equation for a single dependent variable y, which is a function of a one-dimensional spatial variable and, and time. And I'm going to use uh, periodic boundary conditions in, in x. And I'm going to call the largest Lyapunov exponent of this chaotic system uh, lambda max. And lambda max is, is just the inverse of the Lyapunov time. And then uh, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to solve this uh, kuramoto shevashinsky equation by standard numerical techniques and use those solutions to produce uh, simulated measurements. And we're going to use those simulated measurements to predict the future evolution uh, of this system without any knowledge of, of the, the kuramoto shevashinsky equation itself. And for that, 
for those predictions, we're going to use, uh, yeah, we're going to use this, this uh, setup over here. And the input variable u of t is going to be, uh, for each time, it's going to be a vector of, of inputs of the uh, uh, kuramoto shevashinsky variable y uh, uh, on a, a grid point of uh, grid point values that are evenly separated uh, over the periodicity length. So they'll be located at, at uh, uh, evenly spaced points uh, along the length zero to L. And uh, those points are going to be fairly close together so that I, I get a, a good approximation of the continuous spatial dependence in X. And now I just apply this uh, simple uh, idea to the to this system with these measurements or uh, simulated measurements. And here, here is uh, a result that I get for, for an example uh, situation. And uh, the top panel shows uh, the uh, numerical solution of the kuramoto shevashinsky equation where time is starting at zero and running to horizontally to the to to the, the uh, right uh, from zero to five. So these units from zero, rather from zero to twenty, these units are in units of Lyapunov times, exponentiation times, and then the spatial variable. Uh, running from zero to the periodicity length L is plotted vertically, and the uh, and, and the variable Y itself at each uh, grid point and instant of time is color coded and and, and, and as I said, plotted in this uh, top panel. And I'm going to call call this evolution in the top panel the true evolution, and this is for a period of the length of 60, where the solution is, is chaotic. Then the uh, next panel, one panel down from the top panel, is the reservoir, re re reservoir prediction, uh, also color-coded. And this is for a fairly large reservoir. It has a size of, of 9,000 reservoir nodes, and I'll, I'll talk about the reservoir nodes uh, later in the talk, but having 9,000 reservoir nodes is a fairly large reservoir. And then the bottom panel shows the error in the prediction. So it, it's those values of, the, uh, of Y color-coded in the top panel minus those values of Y color coded in, in, in the middle panel. And uh, importantly, the, the color coding of the value zero is, is in sort of a light green color. So if you're looking at the bottom panel and you see this uh, nice green area uh, uh, adjacent to, uh, to, 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 to the uh, zero to L at, at, at the X, at time zero, the green, the solid green area is, is uh, signifying good prediction because the error is near zero. And as long as the green predicts, we're getting good prediction. And it predicts, which seems like we're getting useful predictions out to about five Lyapunov times. And we regard that a, a, as good. But that then brings up the, the next area, the next question, uh, we're, we're also interested in climate prediction, which is much longer than the, the chaos uh, induced uh, stopping of, 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 of the prediction duration. And the question is, does the machine learning then replicate the climate of the, the kuramoto shevashinsky equation, even after the uh, uh, predictions uh, of, of the actual y variable 
have broken down. And in other words, does it does it look like a solution of the Kuramoto Shevchenko equation even after the the uh, the, the the prediction uh, the detail prediction has, uh, has broken down. Another question, uh, another way of saying that, the, the, does the predict, prediction system uh, reproduce the ergodic properties uh, of motions on the chaotic attractor of, of the kuramoto shevchenko equation? And from the, 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 this, this slide, just comparing the, the top and bottom uh, panels, it looks like it is so because if, if I, I contend that if I, I gave you both of these slides and I told you that one of them was the prediction and the other one was uh, the true evolution, you, you would basically, even if you had the kuramoto shevchenko equation, you would, uh, you would not be able to uh, uh, tell which was which, at least easily. Uh, so, so it looks like that's that's true, but uh, we would like to see whether that's true more quantitatively. And uh, uh, this uh, reference by uh, our group uh, with, with J.D. Pathak as the first author uh, has tested that. And what was shown there that was that if you take the machine learn, learning dynamical system, namely, if I go back to this closed loop system on the right, I know that system because I've done the training. So I know what the, the parameters, of the adjustable parameters inside the box are. I know what's in the box. So this is a dynamical system whose equations I could write down and uh, analyze in standard ways. And for example, I could then find the Lyapunov spectrum, the spectrum of all the Lyapunov exponents of this system. And I could do the same thing for, for the uh, uh, kuramoto shevchenko equation itself. And uh, what is found is is that the uh, spectra of of, the, uh, of these two systems match very well, and Lyapunov exponents are long time averages. So th these are ergodic properties; they're being reproduced. So this indicates th th that the uh, ergodic properties, at least in this case, have been uh, produced, reproduced. In general, as shown in, in another paper by our group uh, with first author Zhi Lu in 2018, long-term climate replication occurs provided that the long-term machine learning prediction uh, system dynamics is, is stable. Uh, and and I, I just want to comment a little bit on that. So, the, the original system has a dynamical uh, ha, has a dynamical attractor. The attractor is an invariant set in the state space in nonlinear dynamics uh, uh, language, and it's stable so that nearby orbits approach the attractor. Now the training that you're doing here, just looking at this picture. We're taking orbits on the attractor and we're saying that, that when you're on the attractor, when you're on this invariant set of the unknown system, uh, you, you're trying to, to replicate the orbit on the system. But there's so far nothing in the training that says that that invariant system is going to be an attractor for the, uh, for the closed loop system. So uh, it's not to be taken for granted that you're going to get the, uh, the climate. The, the system could run off to some other uh, region of state space and, 
of the closed loop system that you're not interested in. But, but in this case, it, it has done that. And uh, we explore conditions for that in, in this, this, this paper by Zhijian Lu. So anyway, let, let's leave that for the time being and now go to uh, a hybrid of a knowledge-based system and a machine learning system. And so here we're thinking that, well, the, the, we do know something about the system and uh, we could maybe we could write down some equations for it and put those on a computer. And that's our, our knowledge-based system. But the knowledge-based system may have some errors that may be some some errors in your your uh, in your knowledge. That is, you don't actually accurately know the the physics of the system. Uh, also, parameters of, of the physical system may may have errors, and uh, probably more fundamentally, uh, when you're solving things numerically, you generally have have a, a grid a grid spacing, a, a resolution. And if there are subgrid scale processes going on that, that then feed back to the dynamics of the long scale, that will produce uh, errors and things that we would like to know. So uh, machine learning, on the other hand, uh, comes at it from a data-driven approach. And maybe when I combine these two, I'll, I'll get better, better uh, results. So here is how we do our, our uh, combination uh, <clears throat> using uh, a reservoir computing basis. So uh, again, we, we want to, in the training phase on, on the left, we want to put in U of T and get out a good approximation of U of T plus delta T. So what we do is we put U of T in and we first, input u of t to the uh, knowledge-based uh, model. And we get out a prediction at time uh, t plus delta t from the knowledge-based model. By the way, if, if anybody has any questions, please, uh, uh, please interrupt as, as I'm going along. Anyway. Uh, by the way, could somebody just say something so I know that you're there? <laughs> I don't hear anybody. Yeah, we are here. Did you hear us? Oh, okay. We are here. We, we, we enjoy the talk. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so now this U of T uh, uh, goes into the, the red box, the knowledge-based model with the script M in it. But it also... Uh, goes into uh, this input layer Wn, which maps the, uh, the uh, U of T onto uh, a large number of features or variables, dynamical variables in the reservoir computer. And the reservoir is uh, symbolized by this uh, yellow, uh, oval and uh, in our realization, we realize the reservoir as a, a, a dynamical system of a large number of, uh, of, of dynamical nodes that are evolving in time. And each node has a scalar uh, dynamical state so the number of nodes is, is the number of state variables needed to specify the state of the reservoir. And the evolution of these nodes, is each node is going from time t, evolving from time t, uh, from its time t state to its time t plus delta t state through the influence of the network interactions from the other nodes and from the uh, influence of U of T, which is being inputted to, to, to the network nodes. So what happens then is that the uh, feature variables evolve from time T to time T plus delta T in a nonlinear high dimensional uh, manner. 
Uh, and uh, then what we, we do is we take the output from the, from the knowledge base state and the output uh, uh, of the features at time t plus delta t, and we, 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 we simply combine all those things in a, a bunch of scalars, and the number of scalars that we combine them into is the dimensionality of u, and we're just doing this combination linearly. So uh, what we're doing is we, we're producing an output, which is a linear, which each component of this output vector is a linear combination of all these feature variables and of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, prediction of the knowledge-based device. And then uh, this, this is a linear combination. And then we, we try to choose the, uh, the, the coefficients of all these linear combinations to match what we want, namely the, what the uh, training data says. And this problem is simply uh, a linear regression. So the training here is done by linear regression. The only adjustments of the parameters uh, of this uh, diagram is occurring for the parameters that are given by the W out matrix that's mapping the, these uh, features and the output of, of the, the, the knowledge based uh, model to the uh, output variable U. So that, that, that's why uh, that, that, that's, that's the benefit, one of the benefits of, uh, of, of machine learning that the training is a, a simple linear regression, which can be relatively fast if the, the, the W out matrix is not too enormous. And then we, we just close the loop as before and do the prediction. So now uh, let, 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 let's see how that works uh, in a test case. And in this test case, I'm assuming that uh, the actual system is the kuramoto shevershinsky equation, the same system as, as before, but with about half the, the periodicity length, so it's a little shorter. Uh, and the imperfect system, well, I, you know, sort of just choose something that's, that, 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 that's just like the true Kuramoto system that we're uh, simulating, but it, it's it's spoiled, and we spoil it by by increasing the uh, coefficient of, of the second derivative of y with respect to x term by ten percent, and that's our imperfect system. And then we're going to use a uh, a reservoir computer and also predict using that, and for the reservoir computer, I'm going to use a, a, a relatively small one. Uh, this one has 500 nodes, whereas before we were using 9,000 nodes. Uh, so in this case, we're, 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 we're using a system, a prediction system, which is 18 times smaller than the original one. And what you see here in these panels, the top panel is the uh, actual solution of the real system. The uh, bottom three panels are three different predictions of the system uh, obtained in three different ways. So the top of these three is, is the uh, performance of, of the reservoir prediction. And what's shown here color-coded using the same color coding before is the error in the reservoir prediction. In the middle of the three uh, uh, panels is the error in the uh, imperfect model system with, with a 10% error in, in that y double, y, second derivative of y with respect to x uh, term. And then in the bottom is the hybrid of the two. So what you're seeing in the top panel 
the, the reservoir error panel is that the green area is, is not existing for very much time. Uh, and you, you're seeing a lot of green for just a fraction of a Lyapunov time. And then when you look at the imperfect model, it's even less. It's sort of like a quarter of that. It's really awful. It's not predicting well at all. And then you take the, these two sort of worthless prediction systems, you combine them in the hybrid, and you're seeing a lot of green out to about six Lyapunov times. So you're taking these, these two kind of sort of worthless components, combining them and making a composite system and getting out uh, uh, quite a good result. So th this, this really suggests that this uh, hybrid technique has a lot of power. So now we come to uh, uh, act, what time is it by the way? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so now we, we come to the uh, uh, try, trying to apply this to the, the Earth uh, climate weather system, and, and it's a huge system. And because it's so huge, uh, a straightforward application of what I showed before doesn't work because it, you sort of need to, you would be using a, a very huge a uh, machine learning device, and it'd be very difficult to, uh, to, to train. And in fact, it just doesn't work for, for the, the system that I've shown. So, Sorry, may, may I wonder? Yes. About the hybrid? Can, yes. you, can you elaborate the intuition? How come two wrongs make right in a hybrid mode? Well, okay, yeah. So if I go back to, to this uh, system, you note that you're getting out the output of the reservoir and the output of, of the uh, knowledge base system. And then you're combining them in such a way that maximizes your agreement with the uh, with, with, with the uh, with, with the actual dynamics. So if one of them is making an error of one type that the other one is uh, <laughs> is not making, but uh, vice versa, this combination is going to put all its weight on the one that's that's giving the best answer and ignore the one that's not giving the best answer and vice versa if the roles are, are interchanged. So uh, can, can I ask a question? This is, is my uh, uh, answer to this question. Can, can I ask a question for long? I'm um, yes. Chris Buff, University of Bath. So uh, when you say you're doing a knowledge-based model, does that mean you're solving your imperfect model as accurately as you can using some sort of numerical solver? Yes. Uh -huh. So the knowledge base model is, is high quality data, but on the wrong model and the reservoir is using whatever it is. And then you combine those together. That's right. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Hi, Ed. Can you hear me? This is Lou yes. Uh I would imagine that your W out, the eventual weight you get, would it tell you what parts of the model are also the best. You know, for example, if they're the W out was very big for the reservoir and near zero for the knowledge based model, then the reservoirs are doing most of the work. But it sounds like it should be pretty equally divided and maybe even tell you what parts of those systems uh, it, you can rely on and which can't. Have you yeah, looked at that? That's a, a very good comment. We have not tried to do that for this, but I, I, I think it, it should work. And one of the things we, we did so, sort of use the, the, the w, yeah, although it wasn't in a hybrid, but the, the W out is telling you what you know what what you should be combining. We we used it for inferring 
uh, use the, the W out to infer uh, network connections of an unknown network that's evolving dynamically. But that, that's a very different problem than I'm talking about here. But yes, the, there is a potential of that and you know, it would be a good thing to look at in the future. A any other questions or comments? Okay. So, yeah, one minute. There's a question. Yeah. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah. Hi, Igor here. Um, hi. So, uh, here's a question Have you, the perturbation that you put on the epsilon um, is next to the linear term? So, yeah, a diffusion I, term. I, 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 I don't. You, I don't really think that the, that what we've done here matters. We we just okay. Just we just wanted to spoil the equation somehow. And I mean, we're looking at things. It it it, it isn't. It isn't a, uh, Yeah, I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be the the equation. May not be of the same form. There are all sorts of ways of spoiling it. I, and I I believe that we we would get similar results. But I mean, th there's a specific reason why I'm asking, because the, the hybrid system has a feedback loop to it. And if that feedback loop operates as a linear corrector, it's going to do extremely well in a perturbation of a linear term. But if you perturbed it next to y, y, x, it might not. Uh, so well, I we could try that. I, I, right. Okay, so it hasn't been tried. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Any other things to? Uh... Okay. So. Uh... Yeah, this question. One. Oh, there's another question. Sorry, I have one more. Uh, do you have the um the physical model that was on your slide with the big circle for the reservoir? That's the same as the imperfect model. So the red box here is the same as your imperfect model on the later, later slide. Yes. Is it so? This one outputs something which is one linear transformation away from the next state, but the yeah. imperfect model outputs the right-hand side function. Do you do some uh, matching between these? Like you have like a uh, an, an oh, Euler no, step or something? This is everything that we do. So, yeah. So I mean, mm -hmm. if the imperfect model outputs the right-hand side, like DDT, how do you um, shoehorn that into this red box that? So I'll put something which is the, eventually the, the we we take the model we use u of t as an initial condition we integrate the model forward by uh, an amount delta t and we get an output that's the model's guess as to what u of t plus delta t is but it, it has error and then we put that into the w out oh so the red box does one integration step okay well of the imperfect it could, model. It could be several integration several. steps of the numerical model in the red box but it's oh, one this. step delta t in this in, uh, uh, of this prediction i say thank you uh any other questions now you can go ahead, Sarah. Okay, so now, um, so far we, we've been using the setup that that, that I, I showed over here, but it, it you know for the enormously large spatio-temporally chaotic systems like the climate system, the scheme is, is, is untenable. So. Uh, what we're going to do is for uh, these problems, we're going to employ a parallel convolutional array of many relatively small reservoir computers, each of which is assigned the job of doing the one step delta t prediction of the grid points uh, 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 of the uh, knowledge based model. In, in a small subregion of the Earth's atmosphere. And these small reservoirs uh, can be trained 
independently of each other. And so you can do all of this training in parallel, and it can be uh, rather fast. So also, since the uh, knowledge-based weather model and climate model uh, systems already exist, we're going to make use of that knowledge, uh, the, that previous work, and we would like to hybridize them with the above de described parallel machine learning approach. So uh, I'll skip this slide. So in doing that, <clears throat> uh, we're going to use as our physics-based model, a model called Speedy, which has reduced uh, resolution relative to operational weather codes. Uh, but it realistically incorporates whatever relevant physics there is and uh, three dimensionality, latitude, longitude, and height, and uh, terrestrial uh, geography like uh, continents, oceans, ice covered regions, the Andes Mountains, the Tibetan Plateau, et cetera. And then for the atmospheric and oceanic time series uh, that we're going to use for the machine learning training and also for assessing the accuracy of the predictions of, of the hybrid model itself, this time series is going to be real atmospheric data obtained uh, from uh, the, the European Center for Medium Range uh, Weather Forecasting. So the parallel machine learning component uses uh, 1,152 parallel reservoir computers each one of them is assigned to the prediction of its own local region, which in the diagram is shown as, uh, as blue squares. But these blue squares are cross sections. It's really a, a square cylinder extending from the surface of the earth up to the top of the atmosphere. And it has all the speedy, it has speedy grid points in it. And you can see, I don't know if you can see, but there, there are sort of small uh, small black dots uh, on, 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 shown in this picture. And those are the speedy grid points on the surface of the Earth. Can you see those? Yes, we see them. Yeah. OK. So the middle square has uh, four uh, black dots in it. Uh, but as I said, you're all, it's also including the, the four black dots at, at different height levels. And in order to do the prediction of the uh, computer, reservoir computer assigned to the four, four uh, black dots, the reservoir computer at time t takes as input the states at, at the 16 black dots within the, the red, within the red square. So it overlaps the neighboring regions. So it's, it's taking the 16 inputs at time t, and it's producing the, the four inputs at the, uh, at the four grid points within the square. And the uh, rationale behind this is that if you, we're looking at spatio-temporal chaos, and the rationale is that if you uh, consider a point in space and you make a perturbation at say time t, it takes some time for the effect of that perturbation to uh, uh, propagate or to uh, a distant grid point. And what we're assuming here by using this red square is that the causal dependence of the interior of the, the blue square uh, uh, is only on the, uh, the, the, the uh, state at time t uh, 
in the blue blue square and in this neighboring uh, region that fills up the whole red square. And that's what causally affects the time t plus delta t state in the uh, in the blue square. So that that's the rationale for this uh, application of this convolutional uh, architecture to uh, to prediction. So uh, now there are two uh, predict types of prediction systems that that we look at the. The first one is a weather version where the sea surface temperature is uh, taken as known and independent in, of, of time at each grid point during the duration of the numerical run. And this, of course, is because the, the numerical run is over the forecast time uh, for a weather forecast, which is less than about 10 days. In the climate version, however, when we're looking at climate, the, the ocean dynamics and the atmospheric dynamics are coupled by interacting evolution of the atmospheric uh, sea surface state, temperature state, with, with the uh, uh, atmosphere. And here, the sea surface temperature is, is evolved by a sea surface layer of interacting parallel reservoirs using uh, uh, reservoir computers, but the delta T time step for the, uh, for, for the sea surface temperature reservoir computers is seven days, whereas for the atmospheric variables, the, uh, the, the parallel reservoirs are, are being uh, are taking a time step of six hours. So, you know, it's uh, uh, 24 times, no, seven and six, 28 times slower for the, uh, for, for, for the atmospheric uh, dynamics. And one could also use a, a full uh, knowledge-based model of the, uh, of, of the ocean but we haven't yet done that. We're, we're sort of moving towards that and we'll see if it does any better than, than just using the, uh, the, the uh, reservoirs. So those are the two systems. And whoops, so first I'm gonna show an example of the, the weather prediction. And uh, the, this is just the result of of this weather prediction, which was published uh, this year in this journal, James uh, Journal of Atmospheric Modeling of Earth Systems in, in this year. So uh, uh, what's shown in these three bottom panels, actually, I mean, the three panels basically show the same story. Let's just look at the, at the left panel uh, so uh, this is the a plot of the uh, <clears throat> northern hemisphere uh, our root mean square era in a one day prediction of the uh, uh, of the temperature of uh, in the northern hemisphere uh, uh, region. And what's plotted is horizontally is plotted the root mean squared error, and vertically is plotted the height above the surface of, of the Earth. Uh, <clears throat> and there are three plots. So the three plots are the uh, hybrid model, which is plotted in blue, and uh, the uh, uh, other two plots, the green plot and the uh, sort of orangish yellowish plot are the individual components of the hybrid uh, uh, plotted uh, for their predictions that they get when they're acting alone, not hybridized with each other. And uh, what you see is that the hybrid is doing substantially uh, better has substantially lower 
uh, RMS error, then either uh, of its two individual components acting alone. And this is true in all, all three of the plots. So that's the main thing that we wanted to get across there. So now I'm going to go to the uh, to sort of to the climate prediction. So this is prediction over not one, two, or five days, but over, over years. So uh, in this case, I'm going to do a comparison between a, uh, 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 a conventional state-of-the-art climate model uh, produced purely from you know, physics-based knowledge uh, by the Department of Energy and operated and developed and run at uh, Argonne National Laboratories. So of course, this, this model is fully coupled. So it couples the uh, atmosphere and, and the ocean. Uh, it's a very large model. It has high resolution. And it runs on about uh, 6,000 CPU cores. So this, this model is uh, too big for us at our university, even using all the resources of our university uh, computer center, we cannot uh, currently run this model. The university computer center is in the process of being upgraded and I think we'll be able to run it in the future. But right now we can't run it. Our, our model on the other hand uh, is, is uh, can be trained uh, at our university computer center. And once it's trained, it could be run on, on a, a desktop computer. And it evidently, as I'll show in a minute, uh, captures realistic ocean atmosphere interactions. So uh, to show that it, it does do that, it cap captures the ocean atmosphere interactions. We, uh, we, we, we run it on using training data from the past, and then we, run, we, we predict on, on, a, on a state, on, on a 10 years of state data that are available also from the past, but we pretend that we don't know that data, so we're predicting that. And uh, we, we predict uh, the sea surface temperature. And this uh, bottom left panel is showing um, we're using those that sea surface temperature to uh, plot as a function of time over here, uh, 20, 27 years of uh, prediction uh, of the oceanic uh, Nino in an index. So that's the sea surface temperature average over a certain uh, uh, region of the uh, 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 of the Pacific Ocean. And then you subtract from that the time average of, of, of the uh, of the sea surface temperature. And that's called the oceanic Nino index. And what we get looks, uh, at least to the eye, very similar to uh, uh, what, what you have uh, fr from the actual measurements of the sea surface temperature. So th th we're just at the beginning of this. We have to do a more quantitative comparison. But at least uh, qualitatively, it looks like we're reproducing uh, the correct uh, dynamics. But now let, let me do a comparison of the uh, uh, state of the art model with, with our model. So what's shown on the uh, right is uh, predicted sea surface temperatures uh, for the uh, DOE model, the, the uh, purely physics-based model uh, with, with high resolution, uh, that, that's shown on the top right. And the result from our hybrid sea surface temperature model is shown on, on, on the bottom right. 
And what's, what's shown is for each uh, pixel, we uh, take the predicted sea surface temperature as, as a function of time and, and, uh, uh, and, and look at how it deviates from the actual measured or infer, uh, from the actual data of the determined sea surface temperature. And then we average that difference, that bias over, over time. So what you're seeing then is these colors is, is the temperature bias. And it's color coded with blue if the, uh, if, if the uh, bias is in the, is that it's, that the prediction is too cold and it's color coded as red if the prediction is too hot and the uh, colder it is, the darker the color of blue and the hotter it is, the darker is the color uh, red. And the same color coding is used for the top and bottom panels, and you see that for the bottom panel, you're getting much lighter colors uh, than the top panel, indicating uh, much less bias in our uh, hybrid uh, model sea surface temperature. So uh, it, it looks like, at least preliminarily, that we're doing better. So with that, let me see what time it is. Uh, I guess I, I'm almost, this is my last, well, I'll skip this and go right to the conclusion. So and, uh, there's a lot of work to be done uh, to, to make this really usable. For example, for, for weather, uh, weather prediction is done cyclically every six hours. And uh, so you have to make an estimate of the initial condition to then make a prediction from every, make predictions from every, every six hours. And that's the so-called uh, process of, of data assimilation. And data assimilation uh, for machine learning assisted weather forecasting is, is, is not uh, trivial. Is not a trivial extension of uh, data assimilation for uh, for uh, knowledge-based systems. So that has to be developed. Uh, if you're looking at uh, uh, climate change, you're dealing with non-stationary system with with a non-stationary system that's partially unknown, and uh, you you have to sort of rethink. Uh, the machine learning uh, assisted predictions that, 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 that you had before for, for stationary systems. So th there's a lot of work to be done. However, we, we believe that machine learning will become a standard tool for studying the dynamics of a broad range of high dimensional complex spatial technique systems. Thank you very much.